Okay, good afternoon everyone and uh, thanks very much for, come, for coming along and for joining us online. Welcome to OECD's Green Talk Live, uh, where the topic today is the recent OECD report on investing in climate, investing in growth. Now this report is a uh, major exercise that has been undertaken across the OECD in the last eight months or so. Uh, it brings together the expertise on climate, environment, macroeconomic modeling, finance, trade, agriculture, development, uh, tax, to try and answer the question around how can governments reignite growth in uh, their in their economies these days, while achieving while, while achieving go globally agreed climate goals. Basically, the report tries to lay out the case for governments to pursue an integrated policy approach that combines climate action with fiscal initiatives and structural reforms. Now, the report was released in Berlin on the 23rd of May at the Petersburg Climate Dialogue. It's available free for download online. Uh, it's a big report, some 309 pages, but if you don't have enough time for that, you can read the 25 page synthesis report. If you don't have time for that, you can read the executive summary, which is two pages. And if that is too much for you, we have the key findings also in two pages, but with pretty graphs. So they're all, avail they're all available on the OECD website for this project and that web address will come up at the end of this presentation. So to present the highlights of the report today we have Simon Upton who is the Executive Director of the Environment Directorate at OECD. Uh, he'll take us through in about 20-25 minutes uh, the highlights of the report using a series of, uh, of PowerPoint slides that bring out the key Find the key findings. Uh, we do have a number of contributing authors to the report in the room, so during the question and answer period that follows, uh, we have the opportunity to quiz these experts as well if the questions get more, t more, more, te more technical. If you do want to uh, provide questions or send in questions and you're a, web a webinar part participant, please uh, send comments or questions at any time uh, to Ian, the moderator, on the WebEx website. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Simon, and uh, uh, we look forward to, hear, to, to hearing all the highlights from this report. Well, thank you, Anthony. And after <clears throat> all of those um, alternative um, uh, tranches of um, uh, reporting from two pages to 300 and 50 odd, you might wonder why you need to listen to me. Um, <clears throat> but sometimes um, hearing and seeing is believing. Uh, and so I'm going to take you through some of the key findings. It's, I'm not going to tell a story as I do. It is a, a series of key findings. Um, and then you'll have the chance, as Anthony says, to go back into uh, the detail. And we have people here who are certainly better qualified than I am to expand on those points. Just by way of context, it's become increasingly clear to us at the OECD that uh, climate change involves such an extraordinary um, transition, which will go to the very heart of all of our economies, that it long ago ceased to be an environmental policy issue. Uh, it is absolutely uh, a horizontal uh, concern which can only be addressed by governments using the full array of policy tools that touch on just about every area of government. The first time we put this sort of reasoning together was just prior to uh, COP21 in Paris and we produced uh, this um, uh, also a door stopper, uh, 229 pages, aligning policies for a low carbon economy. And what we tried to do there was to say, look, uh, it's fine to have climate policies like uh, putting your toe in the water of emissions trading schemes or taxes. But if the rest of the economy isn't wired to respond and send those signals and to allow new businesses into the game, you may not get very far. 
And so we've carried that logic forward in rather greater detail in this uh, new report. Um, and this was done to support uh, Germany's G20 presidency. Uh, and using a G20 lens, we really try to uh, answer uh, this point. Okay, if there's a massive transitional uh, change uh, coming, if there's a massive change to the structure of our economies, surely this is going to be disruptive. Uh, is this so costly that we can't afford it? And our view is that uh, it is not so costly that we can't afford it. In fact, we think that if it's done well, and it's done in a way that really does engage all the policy levers, it should be seen as a major opportunity. That it is one which can enable uh, an increase uh, in the growth rate, and it can achieve a lot of the development goals which are so pressing uh, in many developing and emerging economies. But we needed to put that to the test and try to understand the range of policies that are out there and to understand at a macro level what this means um, for economic activity. So an important part of this report, which is in chapter four, uh, is a modeling exercise undertaken by the economics department uh, of the OECD with the assistance of uh, uh, many others. Uh, and I just want to take you quickly through the results of this. So if you look at this slide uh, entitled uh, combining climate action with economic reforms will lead to an increase of 1% of GDP across G20 economies, you will see that we've decomposed the growth effects into a number of things. Uh, there's the effect, the direct effect of increasing uh, investment in infrastructure. One of the things we know looking forward is that in developing and emerging economies, and there are some very important ones in the G20, there is a demand, a huge demand to house people, to provide modern communications and transport systems, to provide energy for all. All of these things require trillions of dollars uh, in infrastructure investment. So increasing the level of that investment, which is an imperative for those countries, and in another way, an imperative for developed countries who often have old infrastructure that needs to be replaced, getting investment at a level which will achieve the ambitions of everyone means more investment, and that has a positive contribution to the economy. And it's not just physical infrastructure. <coughs> there are also soft items. Uh, it's, it's skills, it's training, it's R&D. And that's what that second uh, column is. And then you see the third one, which is a rather large green bar, structural reforms. One of the things the OECD has done uh, for uh, at least uh, 15 years now is to try to uh, understand using modeling what the growth advantages of structural reform. Uh, structural reform meaning um, an environment, a regulatory environment that reduces the barriers to investment. And that's where uh, there, we think in many economies, nothing to do with climate, there is very significant potential uh, for a higher level of investment, which would then boost growth. So those first three columns are contributing uh, positively to growth. But of course, if you are uh, taking action on climate, um, you are going to impose some costs uh, by introducing uh, climate policies, um, and you will inevitably strand some assets. They simply will not be any longer uh, able to contribute economically. And so there is a some growth to be subtracted, and that's the orange bit. But the story across uh, all of those um, bars ends up at around 1% increase in GDP across the G20 economies by uh, 2021. And the story doesn't stop there because that's the very short term. Uh, the sorts of investments we're talking about on the left-hand side, which are to do uh, with infrastructure, with capacity, with regulatory reform, these things have a much longer time horizon, obviously, than uh, five years. And so we looked out to 2050 uh, with the modeling, and there you see the pattern and those growth uh, increments amplified over the longer period. 
and once again, um, uh, some reduction in growth uh, associated um, uh, with uh, the uh, driving down on the fossil side. Uh, and so you get a, a net uh, contribution, a net extra contribution to GDP of 2.8% across the period. But of course, that's not the only advantage. Uh, the other advantage is that you are seeking to head off climate damage. And OECD has done a lot of modeling on this front, as have others. And we know that, of course, climate damages will start to accrue and grow as we move towards the middle of the century. So when you add in uh, the, uh, the effect of avoiding damages, then the additional growth looks closer to 5%. So that's th what I've shown you so far is based on the assumption that we want a 50% chance of getting uh, to 2 degrees. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, the world would like to do more. Uh, at Paris, it talked about rather hopefully 1.5 uh, uh, degrees. Well, we haven't modeled 1.5 degrees, but what we have modeled is a higher probability of getting there. And that's what we call the 66% uh, uh, chance of getting to two degrees. And this is what uh, the growth contribution still looks like. So this is taking an even more ambitious approach and you're driving down even more on uh, the fossil fuel side. You're, you're trying to put more pressure there to shift more resources and to the non-fossil side of the economy. And here are the contributions. Uh, so there's going to be more investment, even more ambitious investment in this model. And there is the contribution to growth. Um, and structural reform, again, uh, there's a bigger cost this time because you are taking a, a, a tougher approach, but you've still got uh, a net uh, a positive contribution to GDP across the G20 countries. And again, almost the same, that avoided uh, damage means that it's a very uh, substantially positive figure. Now look, this is just a model. We know that, you know that. Uh, and of course, uh, it is simply a, a schematic representation. But it is actually built on uh, a, a lengthy uh, experience of modeling uh, in this organization. Uh, and this is an organization which has really taken structural reform probably more to heart than any other intergovernmental organization. And you'll note that there was really very significant uh, gains to be made there. So the, the message is if, if countries are prepared to tackle climate uh, vigorously uh, and to wholeheartedly, not, not tentatively, but do, to do it across the board and have the, the necessary supportive flanking measures to cope with the transitional changes, uh, then this is not uh, a negative story by any means. In fact, it's a positive one. It's one which should be able to secure the growth and development uh, goals, which all countries have, and importantly, head off uh, damage, uh, which will, if we don't get on top of it, not just accrue by the middle of the century, but get even worse in the second half of the century. So uh, I've got colleagues here who are experts on how this modeling exercise was put together. They can answer specific questions. But the big broad picture is we think countries can be confident that if they're prepared to take the issue seriously and take it by the horns, uh, there are upside opportunities here. So that's the first uh, part of the story uh, and probably uh, the one which most people would want to take headline confidence from. Let me now take you through a few other uh, things, if I can get this to move on. Um, we talk in that modeling exercise about increasing the amount of investment, and that's increasing the amount of investment in infrastructure to get us to where everybody wants to get to on things like uh, energy telecoms, power and electricity, water and sanitation, primary energy supply, transport. And those are the, the, the segments of the cake. Currently, the world's spending about $6.3 trillion a year on infrastructure. Uh, and we, is that correct? No, 3.4. I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. I'm just, I'm, my trouble is I'm looking at this at a distance. No, the, the world's currently spending about 3.4 to 4 trillion. It needs to be spending 6.3 trillion to achieve the, the goals that we want. So 
right now the investment in infrastructure is suboptimal. So nothing to do with climate. Again, if you just want to, to get to an optimum level of investment to deliver all of those things that the SDGs, for instance, talk about, uh, to deliver the, the, the improvements in the quality and the quantity and quality of life people want, then you'd need to be not at 3.4 to 4, which is what that little red bracket on the right-hand side is, that's where we are currently, but up at 6.3. Then on top of that, if you wanted to make that investment in infrastructure, one which was consistent with two degrees, you'd need to spend a bit more. But the message is that it's not that much more. It's the column on the right. You'd need to spend 6.9 trillion a year. So you can see that the difference uh, is not that spectacular. And of course, at the same time, if you did that, uh, you are making significant expenditures on fossil uh, fuel. Uh, and they come out at around $1.6 trillion a year in savings. So instead of spending 4.7 on fuel, it's 3.1. So when you put that together, again, you can see why we're saying that this is not such a big problem that uh, it is going to overwhelm us. We can't do it. Yes, there's an increment in investment needed. There's, a, we, well, there's more than an increment. There's a big increment needed to achieve the goals the world wants in the sustainable development goals type uh, setting. But to make it green instead of just any old color, uh, it's not that much more. And there is an even larger saving uh, in fossil fuel expenditure. <clears throat> Let me just say a little bit about how things would shift if we move towards the two degrees uh, world that we want to. Uh, what this uh, crescent shows you is where power sector uh, capacity additions are currently going to be coming from. And uh, already renewables are a very significant chunk of that picture. But if you want to go to two degrees, it's going to have to look like that. So. Uh, rather than, uh, this is just over the next 15 years, rather than 67% of the new additions uh, being from renewables, uh, that would need to rise to 71. And you can see the one which goes right down uh, is the, 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 the pink bit, uh, that's coal. And I could just show you, I'll just bring up the other two bits of that graph for you in the next slide. So uh, to get to two degrees, the amount of new capacity in coal-fired generation is going to have to fall from currently 21% of what's projected over the next 15 years to just uh, 8%. And some of that slack um, is obviously taken up by increased renewables, but some of it is also taken up by gas, which uh, on this modeling exercise would increase from five to 15. Gas, of course, is a fossil fuel, but it's a less uh, CO2 intensive one. Uh, it is a bridging fuel. I think the debate now, which is open, is how much of a bridge is needed from that source, given the extraordinary progress that uh, renewables are making. And certainly, uh, in any infrastructure planning, uh, we'd say that governments really have to have an eye on how fast that is changing. Simply accepting uh, the relative cost competitiveness of these fuels today doesn't tell you what's going to happen in three years time or four or five years time. There's a lot of change underway. It's a very dynamic time. Again, that's why if all countries decide to act, that dynamic system change is likely to see cost fall even faster. And so the adjustment uh, may be from an economic point of view, much easier to achieve than you might have imagined. Now, this um, rather uh, interesting looking slide, uh, we argued, I should tell you, about how we could make this uh, interesting. And that was the most interesting thing we could come up with. I think it's rather weird. But there are three bits. Um, one is that you need a well-aligned investment environment. Secondly, you need pro-growth structural reform. I've explained that. And thirdly, you need policies that uh, targeting climate change. I've said a lot about structural reform and these sorts of things, but you do actually have to do something about carbon emissions. And so pricing them um, or having uh, regulatory measures or whatever that's necessary, all three together 
uh, is what's needed for a well-aligned policy. And that was, as I say, at the heart of what we uh, recommended prior to the Paris COP, and this book remains as relevant today as it was then. Changing tack completely, um, what it means is that everybody uh, in the asset allocation, in the investment business, has to uh, look at where uh, capital is flowing. And this slide tells you uh, where currently the multilateral development banks are with respect to infrastructure investment. Uh, that will contribute to climate mitigation and adaptation. The big grey circles, the amount they're investing currently in climate mitigation and adaptation infrastructure, and the green uh, is the amount of it which is uh, actually uh, consistent with where we need to go uh, on climate. So all you could say is that whether we're talking about energy or transport or water, uh, there's plenty of room to green the investment portfolio of uh, the multilateral development banks. But the same would apply to any uh, investors, to any banks. Uh, there is uh, much that can be greened. And the OECD has done a lot of work here. We have a green finance center, uh, which is looking at all the policy settings uh, and the uh, incentives uh, and barriers that determine how much capital is allocated to green as distinct from brown. And given that, the 6.9 trillion that you saw before, which is needed for infrastructure to be on the uh, two degree consistent pathway, given that that money is overwhelmingly going to come from the private sector, then we'd say that you need to look very hard at the regulatory uh, settings uh, that will influence where um, uh, money goes. Now, somebody's decided to advance the slide for me, so I'm forced to move on. Are you going to do this now? Okay, sorry. Somebody just sneezed and it moved. This was my next slide. Um, all G20 countries have scope to improve the quality of their infrastructure for uh, sustainable growth and well being. Again, at the beginning, I, I showed you the shortfall we're currently spending uh, around you know, three and a half, four trillion, and it needs to go up to 6.3 uh, or 6.9 if you want to get to two degrees. Uh, there's plenty of room for uh, improvement. Uh, we've looked at a number of different measures uh, here. We've looked at what we know about access to services. So who's got access uh, to water, for instance, who's got access to sanitation. We've also looked at the quality of uh, different types of infrastructure. Don't interpret the circle as adding up to 100% of anything. This is, it's just a wheel to show you uh, the various um, uh, attributes of some of the attributes of infrastructure that we're talking about. And using uh, data from a, a variety of sources, some from the World Economic Forum surveys, some from our own work, this is what uh, the current state uh, of infrastructure looks like. Uh, that is in high income countries. So in the spider diagram, you can see that uh, in some areas on the left there, uh, it's pretty well uh, state of the art and looking good, but there are gaps. Uh, we're, we're well beyond, be, be, uh, short of the optimum on some of those, those attributes. Uh, this is middle income, uh, upper middle income countries, emerging economies, the footprint shrinks, and then looking at um, lower middle income countries, uh, I just can't read at a distance of 50 meters, um, you can see that it shrinks even further. So the point is uh, that uh, whether you're a, a, a lower middle or a higher middle or a high income country, uh, there is plenty of room to improve infrastructure. And uh, if, it's, if it's well done and the investments are well made, they're going to yield a lot of benefits, both uh, materially, uh, economically, and also in, in ways that we probably don't measure in terms of, but very importantly, in terms of people's well-being. Um, G20 countries start from different places in meeting the challenge um, of uh, getting to two degrees. And what this uh, diagram shows you 
uh, on vertical axis is the CO2 intensity uh, of, um, and of, of energy and on the horizontal axis, the energy intensity of GDP. So plotting those two together, you get the starting positions of countries. And this is where we are today. So you've already got um, quite a lot of countries who aren't even near where they need to be in terms of uh, energy intensity, uh, given the energy demands of their economies. That's all the dots above the line. But you've got some economies that already uh, are below the line, where, where we need to be for two degrees. But let, let's look at how this evolves over the decades. So there we are um, in 2030, and straight away uh, we've mopped up almost all the countries. Only France has a lower energy intensity for its output. Uh, and by the time you get to 2040, no one is inside, and that's where we need to be in 2050. So if you want the sort of uh, energy intensity per unit of GDP, uh, which um, uh, um, I think many people would want for reasons of quality of life, you're going to have to, to be right, right down. And that's why that last line is going to be a very uh, ambitious one and challenging one to, to, to reach. So the, the, the message from this slide simply is that the challenge is one of constantly improving the energy efficiency of our economies and the CO2 intensity of each unit of output. And that's what pr progress is going to have to look like. And as you can see, not all countries even uh, are near where the 2020 line needs to be. Um, next, um, we always make the point at the OECD that putting a price on carbon is a very good way of sending a serious signal about your intentions with respect to climate change. Um, and this uh, block of, of circles on the left uh, all CO2 emissions from energy use, uh, that's the total. And the green dots are the percentage of those emissions that are priced at above 30 euros a tonne. And then uh, the yellow circles are emissions that are priced, but they're pro priced at somewhere between zero and 30 euros a tonne. And the orange are the emissions that aren't even priced. So 62%, almost two thirds of CO2 emissions are currently not subject to a carbon price. And the story is a little bit more, a little bit worse even than that, because most countries do tax uh, fuel for transport, fossil fuel for transport. Uh, and the reason they do that is not really because of the climate. In many cases, it's just a very convenient way of raising excise duties. So if you take transport out of it, then the size of emissions shrinks. And you'll see then that only 4% of emissions are priced at over 30 euros a ton, 20% um, at, at uh, something below that, and 70% are unpriced. Now, the message here uh, couldn't be clearer, that there is, in the same way that there's much more infrastructure that could be valuably built, there is much more emissions that could be usefully uh, taxed or priced. Um, I won't say a lot about the slide, but it's simply to make the point uh, that there are uh, so many links between a low carbon climate resilient infrastructure and the sustainable development goals. So our message is that taking climate seriously in the holistic way we've talked about it is going to mean that countries address all sorts of sustainable development goals at the same time. Uh, and that's the beauty of the Sustainable Development Goals. They are interlinked. Uh, climate is, of course, one of them. But act, taking action will assist you on many other fronts. Um, and finally, uh, climate-related infrastructure plans. How are G20 countries progressing? And we surveyed the state of play across uh, the uh, array of infrastructure types that you can see at the bottom. And we asked, first of all, uh, which countries had a target in respect of those? So a target for, uh, for their renewables, a target uh, with respect to electric vehicles, 
a target with respect to fossil fuel. You'll see that there. But if you know how much fossil fuel you're going to put there in place, uh, that's better than not having any idea at all. Uh, once you know what it is, then you might decide you want to bring it down. So that's, that's the number of countries um, that, that have a target. And you can see the largest one is renewables, the second one from the left, 17 countries out of the G20 countries have got a target uh, for renewables. So there's still three that haven't. Secondly, how many countries have got an infrastructure plan? Now, this is an important finding, uh, and this shows where there's a lot of progress to be made. The OECD's view uh, is, and this is the result of a lot of work we've done on the investment side, that having an infrastructure pipeline is pretty important if investors are going to come to town. And having an infrastructure pipeline, which has been thought through in terms of being a climate uh, compatible one, uh, is even more important. And here you can see that the largest number of countries that have an infrastructure plan is respect of road and rail and ports. Um, uh, and there's one there where I think the number is zero. Yes, electric vehicles. No one's got an infrastructure plan which actually makes reference to electric vehicles. So again, I mean, this is not a question about planning, some faith in planning, but if you've thought about the issues and spilled out where you think you might need to be, then, then it's the time to think about the policies that you would want to put in place. So we're using infrastructure plans as a proxy for evidence that countries have thought about things. And then finally, uh, if you've got a plan, have you put a budget beside it? In other words, have you have got some idea what the resource implications are going to be? And again, you can see that it's a pretty mixed uh, innings there. The largest one is road and rail. Now, of course, a lot of these plans have not been put there with climate uh, in mind. Um, we'd suggest that it's, it is good, it makes good sense for countries to have thought about their infrastructure pipeline so that investors know what they're moving into in a particular marketplace. Uh, it, it makes it easier to plan if, if, there's, if there's some sense that it's not on again, off again, that there's a long-term plan to develop these network, uh, these elements of network which underpin our economies. Uh, the levels of information there tell you how far away uh, the, not the total number of G20 countries are from getting there. And the answer is, again, uh, there are plenty of gaps. Um, this is a nice slide uh, just to uh, remind us all that, of course, governments are entangled with CO2. The carbon entanglement, a word we invented here, uh, countries um, they don't. They know they've got to move away from fossil fuels, but but you know fossil fuels do provide one way or another uh, quite a lot in the way of rents and royalties. Uh, that was what it was like between 2001 2005. Um, that's what it was between 2006 2010 and going up again 2011 2015. So you can see significant increases in government revenues coming from. Uh, uh, fossil fuels and 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 there there you have the figures as a percentage of gdp that's the top one and a percentage of total government revenue you can see government revenue uh going up to nearly seven percent and staying at that level uh over the end of the 15 year period so governments have shall we say a vested interest in the revenue that uh, fossil fuels provide them with one of the things they're going to have to think about is how, if the fossil revolution that they want takes place, how they replace those revenue streams. Uh, and that is also part of aligning policies. So that's it. That is not, as I say, a narrative. It takes some of the highlights from the report, uh, gives you um, a feeling for uh, what's in here. Um, I do recommend this. Certainly, we hope that not just all G20 countries, but certainly all OECD member countries and others will take it seriously and ask officials uh, how they would make sense of it in a national context, because it's the putting together of the pieces of this jigsaw which will get us to where we need to be, which is uh, an emissions profile consistent with holding temperature increases to two degrees. I'll stop there and very happily take uh, questions or at least my more uh, learned colleagues will take questions. 
Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, yes, we have an opportunity now to have questions from those people in the room here, as also from the large number of people who are joining us, who are, join, who are joining us on the, web, the webinar. We already have a few questions coming in from there. Uh, just while you're gathering your questions, just note that on the screen there, there is the uh, website for the uh, for the project for the report, where you can download the report and the supplementary material. Supplementary material. So. Uh, might open the floor maybe for a question from the room uh, here before we get, get into questions from the web. I guess all the people who wrote the report here <laughs> are here and they, they, they know exactly what's in it and uh, exactly what questions not to ask or to ask. So uh, we'll start with Jane. Hi, um, I have a question about the infrastructure. Uh, we had a stack bar um, and it said that um, the uh, infrastructure expended in, in transport would be the same and that in water and sanitation would be lower. Um, so could you explain that? Thanks. We might get that graph back up and uh, in the meantime, who would like to answer that? Uh, I think Virginie may want to deal with that, deal with that one. Thanks for your question, uh, Jane. Not an easy one. Uh, there's one thing that uh, people need to be aware of is that there are a lot of uncertainties in any projection in terms of uh, infrastructure numbers, in terms of the needs um, in the future without thinking about climate change, and in terms of the existing spending uh, that governments are making on infrastructure. So all the numbers are highly uncertain, but in the methodology to develop those projections, we decided to be consistent and not to try to add apples with oranges um, so that the numbers are reflecting one vision or one thinking of a low carbon world. Those numbers are based on uh, the projections from the IEA, from the World Economic Outlook uh, that they developed in 2017. And in this model, they are not planning any model shifts as a strategy to um, develop a low carbon, a low carbon future. So most of the policies regarding transport are actually uh, included in the energy part of the infrastructure needs, and particularly on increased investment regarding electric vehicles, a switch from traditional fossil fuel vehicles to electric vehicles, um, as well as um, uh, more investment in, yes, electric infrastructure and all, all the infrastructures needed. So a significant a significant part of the increase um, in energy is related to more en energy efficient modes of transport. And that's why uh, regarding the investment on transport per se, they are kept stable because it's the key hypothesis of the WIA model. I have to flag that in many other models, they, there are some different views um, that and we couldn't reflect that on, on, this, uh, on this chart. For instance, some modeling are suggesting that investment in transport might be lower because if you really include modal shift in your in your modeling exercises, um, you might need less road, um, but actually the extra cost of, of investing in public transportation system is higher than the saving you have on roads. But on the other end, you, you need less parking space. And this is one of the main budgetary um, uh, uh, posts in, in many OECD countries. So just to flag that this is one possible future in terms of planning for infrastructure needs that we've been quite conservative um, and, and trying to be a bit pessimistic in terms of what is the extra cost uh, that a low, a low carbon future could add to the existing um, projections, but that other visions could be could be possible as well. Thanks, Virginie. And for those of you who have joined us online, that's Virginie Marshall, who's led the work on our infrastructure uh, estimates there. We have to, might take a question from uh, a webinar participant now. This is from um, Florian uh, Lachanecker. Apologies if I've got the pronunciation wrong. But the question is, uh, should we invest now and risk being locked in to current technology or invest, late, invest later and risk initiating the transition too late? Uh, there's a, there's, I guess there's two levels of question here, or two levels of answer. One is, uh, 
in general the the uh, issues around delaying a transition and then what do you actually how did we cover this in the report so well, maybe just as a, as a general point and, and yeah. perhaps the modelers might like to talk yeah. about the assumptions but the OECD's preference is always uh, to leave those technical choices to market participants uh, in other words to, to develop a regulatory uh, and taxing structure which doesn't seek to pick winners so that's why uh, reasonably powerful climate policies which are price-based make sense because then investors have to weigh up those risks and uh, you're going to get um, a case of different judgments being made and you're not putting all your eggs in one basket but, but that the uncertainty uh, is a very real one and given that the government is because climate is only going is only going to happen because uh, to some extent governments are saying this is a policy imperative and we want it to happen then governments have to be very careful that they uh, don't try to ordain the way forward uh, that it's going to be innovation in a competitive marketplace uh, which is going to see some technologies come out ahead of others now in terms of the assumptions in the model perhaps Andreas you can tell us well for the for the energy investment we have we have used um investment scenarios by the International Energy Agency, which uh, tries to, uh, to make a case for how, how these investments should, should evolve over time. Um, so there's a whole time profile for, for investment into, into decarbonization. The project also shows what the impact could be if action is delayed substantially, so if climate action is deferred to around 2030. And, and the exercise shows that the costs would then be substantially bigger. And, and, and one important reason is that in the meantime, there would be investments in, the, in, in kinds of infrastructures and in kinds of in capital goods that are inconsistent um, with decarbonization, such as um, coal power plants. Um, so the report shows that early action is indeed important to minimize cost. And that just underscores the issues or the important issues that are bundled up in the uh, stranded assets dis discussion. So the longer you delay the transition, the more likely you are to have significant impacts from, from stranded assets. We do have another bundle of questions from webinar participants around the job impacts. Uh, we haven't mentioned that in the, pre in the presentation so far, but uh, we do have a look at the impacts on, em on employment in this report. Um, uh, so that we had a series of questions about uh, did we assess the employment impact of, this, of scenarios? Uh, uh, what about job loss and, and, cre and, and, and creation? Uh, the answer is yes, we, we did look at that, and we've been interested in this topic for uh, some years. I, I'm going to pass to, to Andrew Prague, who uh, was responsible for this part of it, but just to say generally that uh, we don't think that uh, the green transition, if you like, um, is as big as some of the other transitions that we're facing, whether we're talking about the demographic transition globally, which is huge, or whether we're talking about something like digitalization, the, sh the penetration of um, ICT, which has just completely uh, turned upside down the way uh, which much of what the world produces produces and where it's produced and, and how. So uh, the, the, the two degrees target and, and what that implies is relatively uh, smaller. Uh, and of course, yes, there will be job, jobs created and jobs destroyed, um, but as there are in, in, in labour markets all the time, but that the net effect is not large. It's slightly positive, but Andrew, you can give us chapter and verse there. Well, I, I'll be brief. <laughs> uh, just to say uh, that, well, in the modelling in this exercise, there was at the macro level, uh, I think a small positive overall net job increase in these low carbon scenarios. We were careful not to put too much weight onto that and to not uh, look at those macro numbers in too much detail because we recognise more qualitatively in the report that it's really not about net job increases when you look at these deep transition scenarios. It's about which jobs are being created and which jobs are being lost, as Simon said. 
Uh, and therefore, we focused a lot on understanding what are the policy mechanisms that can help with that transition. We engaged with partners at the International Trade Union Confederation. They have a big exercise underway in what they call the just transition, really understanding uh, if, if there are s sectors where considerable jobs will be losses, will be lost, such as in, for example, coal mining, coal-fired power generation, whole communities that depend on these sectors. What measures can governments put in place? What dialogue should they be getting into? What planning should they be doing to make sure that there are retraining opportunities, relocation opportunities to, to support those lost jobs as uh, new jobs are created in uh, in low carbon and, and more modern sectors, um, recognizing that the two are not an obvious uh, replacement without significant uh, planning and policy action. So there's a chapter on that in the report. Andres, you want to jump in there? And one reason is for what Simon Neptun was saying that the the reallocation of employment as a result of decarbonization is not is not that big across sectors as as a result of of decarbonization policies relative to historic norms. It's really quite modest. Nothing to be very frightened of is that that the um, that the kind of energy industries that would really have to uh, downscale um, coal-based, um, oil-based industry, that the employment shares in, in the total economy are, tend to be rather small. That, of course, does not mean that one should not care about it, but that this can, with appropriate policies, be, be managed. So at the macro level, it's quite modest. But at the regional level, it could be quite significant. So the regional politics becomes into a, into play here, where you have regions that are have, have that are heavily dependent on fossil fuel industry based resource uh, in in fossil fuel based industries and and, and so on. Uh, more chance for questions from the room, and we have a list of questions from the webinar participants as well. Any questions from Rob? Rob the link. Yeah. Thanks. Um, very interesting results. Very interesting presentation. I have one question, and that is, when I look at the 50% versus 66% two degree scenarios by 2050, I see that for the 66%, you have a full percent of GDP larger increase from structural reforms and green innovation. And I was wondering whether you can explain how uh, getting that increase or lowering for emissions below the 50% two degrees, how that can boost structural reforms, how it can boost GDP. Yes, the, it's, the, it's the other way around. Structural reforms will boost, G, boost GDP. But Andres, do you want to uh, respond to that one? Um, part of the answer to the question is, uh, is a bigger scale for um, green innovation. And another part of the answer is that there is, that there is an, an interaction between um, regulatory action um, to to achieve climate goals, uh, to limit temperature increase, we so we need to be stricter on on CO2 emission targets. We need to be stricter on CO2 pricing, and um, there is an uh, if regulatory policies on the economy side and the relation of product markets is such that investment is favoured, then the investment response uh, to such to the regulatory action that we need to achieve uh, to limit global warming to two degrees is is better. <laughs> so, in other words, um, if you the impact of product market regulation of growth friendly regulation is is the stronger, the stricter you are on the on the on the climate front, because enterprises will respond better with more investment to stricter climate policies if the regulatory environment is favorable for growth. Thanks very much. Uh, while you're thinking more questions or even comments from the room, we do have, we'll take another question from the webinar participants. Um, this one is from Quentin Dupriez, uh, who asks, how much confidence evidence uh, do we have that product market reforms have an effect on output growth in the long run as opposed to just a short-lived effect. Uh, can structural reforms really fully compensate the costs of, clim of, of climate action? So this gets to the question of uh, the basis of our, uh, around, of our analysis here is that it's an integrated approach with 
climate policy, structural reforms, fiscal initiatives that are going to give you the most holistic approach to achieving these goals of reigniting growth and generating uh, uh, an achievement of, cl of, of climate goals. So, Andres, do you want to take that take that one? The structural reforms, the durability, the durability over the short versus long term impacts. Um, yeah, the there are short term impacts, um, which uh, which result from 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 uh, additional business creation, additional investment. But of course, the additional investment by boosting the capital stock will have a bigger long term effect because the investment uh, takes time to to build up. Just just one point, which may not be directly related to the question, though, but it, it's it's not unrelated. Uh, one of the things which uh, work done in both the economics department and the environment directorate uh, has stressed uh, is that um, it's vital that policies don't stand in the way of new technology and new business uh, penetrating. Uh, that the the transition requires um, really an upheaval uh, in technology and and so if you have a regulatory uh, environment which is frozen around maintaining existing businesses and not just businesses but existing business models then as I said earlier even quite a strong carbon price won't yield the 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 change that you want so the the dynamism with which uh, industry and investment can respond is going to be critical. Otherwise, even though you could make a break with the past, the business models uh, and the technologies that could do that may not be able to penetrate in the market. So I think that's, that's quite an important uh, element uh, and we've done work on policy stringency and what that can tell us um, about uh, growth and the answer is uh, stringent environmental policies are not necessarily bad for growth at all, uh, certainly at the level of the economy and, and certainly at the level of sectors. When it comes to businesses, though, yes, there are winners and losers. But if you are basically protecting the losers, then you won't get the economic effects, uh, uh, the positive economic effects that you want. So that's an important um, point, I think. Yeah, and and, and uh, we've done research for this project, which which shows precisely this: that uh, if uh, countries have regulatory environments which foster firm creation, which foster competition, um, then the response of businesses to to stricter environmental regulation is more positive. The sense of more productivity and more investment. Thank you. Yeah. Andrew, you wanted to jump in. Just to complement that, maybe with a, an example of, that might help people to see what we mean in this in this product market regulation in this particular area, which is about electricity markets and how, with the rapid growth in renewables, we've reached a point where in many OECD countries the electricity markets are still designed around big centralised plants and uh, significant regulatory reform to redesign those markets in a way that is more conducive to additions of renewables and new ways of balancing electricity markets, new ways of integrating demand response uh, would considerably open up uh, the terrain for more investment in renewables and better utilization of those resources. So it's an example of the, the way you can see growth effects arising from uh, product market regulation that's very specific to the low carbon area. Okay, thanks. We we are running out of time, but we have time for one one last question, uh, and we'll take it from the web again. Um, and this, there have been a few questions uh, around fossil fuel, su fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, Charlie Tomlinson and Peter Rawl, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, and we haven't mentioned fossil fuel subsidies much at all in this presentation today, but this is obviously some an area where the OECD has got a lot of uh, history in analysing, in, in documenting and analysing fossil fuel, su fossil fuel subsidies. And the question was, when you look at the um, elements of the, the the slide that you had up there about the um, uh, carbon entanglement uh, if you if you factor in fossil fuel subsidies uh, what does that mean as well as you add that in on top of, of that uh, of those that that just 
underscores the um, uh, symbiosis between government revenues and the possible subsidies that they give then then give back to the to the to the sector. So they don't give them because they only give it to their lessons. Andrew. Uh, just to say that that particular chart that was shown with the rents for, to governments from fossil fuel production is is rents rather than revenues. So it's it's not this is not the total uh, government receipts from fossil fuels for which you could then say well we subtract the subsidies to get to a sort of net figure. This is already rents. This is calculated by saying what the overall value of these fossil fuels on the global market minus the specific local cost in that particular country. If there's a gap, then that's the rent that the government's getting. So it's 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 a good idea, the principle to say, well, we should compare this to the possible subsidies, but it's not as simple as just deducting them from these numbers. But it's it's a good point that's raised. We'll, we'll think about how to present that differently with the subsidies included. Okay, so we've uh, we've run out of time. We're up to our our all our allotted hour. I'd like to um, thank you all very much for participating both in the room here. Um, and also on the webinar, we had a large number of questions, uh, which unfortunately we couldn't get to all of them in the time available. So uh, thanks very much, Simon, for presenting the report uh, so so well. And just a reminder, if you want to um, get hold of, of a copy of the report or the or the supporting material, the set of synthesis and the executive summary and so on, please go to the website, which is on the screen or was on the screen and is on the screen again. Uh, and uh, Green Talk Live, which will be in September, and we'll provide details of that on our website. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you.